I appreciate being asked to speak here. Um, I was looking at the list of speakers at this event and your sessions that you have planned out in your schedule. And it's pretty impressive, the quality and the caliber of people who are here who are presenting. And I was looking at where they're from and what their titles were and what the session content. And I'm really impressed by this conference. And I know what you all are thinking. You want to be here learning about doing cool things with maps, and now you're in the keynote listening to somebody talk about social media? What? Well, don't worry. Um, I'm going, at the end of the day, I'm going to relate everything to GIS and, and talking about. Um, I figure that my value that I can bring to you is talking about bigger picture and outside perspective of how other people look at GIS and GIS in the social space and give you some thoughts on uh, using some social tools for your own agencies. But first let me tell you a little bit about me and I know they, they called me GovGirl and that's okay. It's not a cut down or anything. I gave myself the GovGirl name. And let me tell you a little bit about what I do and why I'm here. They mentioned that I work for eRepublic. That's the parent company behind magazines like Government Technology and Governing, Emergency Management, Public CIO. They also host digital government summits across the country. And, um, but al although I work for eRepublic, as it was mentioned, I got my start in government and I started working for a tiny little town in Illinois called the town of Cortland, Illinois. It was one of those really small municipalities. We certainly didn't have a GIS program, and we had about 3,500 residents. It was one of those, if you've ever worked for a really, really small agency, you know it's one of those situations where everyone has a job and they also have some other jobs as well. You know, so like the janitors, also like the mayor, things like that. <laughs> Well, my role was as the deputy clerk, and so as the deputy clerk, I got to learn a lot about how government agencies work, albeit a very small agency. And then down the line at different government agencies, I wound up at the city of Reno, Nevada. And I thought, I have arrived. How many of you have been to Reno? Okay, so you know I was a little bit misled. <laughs> No, actually, I came to really love the community, and I still live in Reno. I won't leave. But one of the things I did was I worked on uh, web services, and I managed their web program, and I launched their social media presence. And I learned a lot along the way. As I was working for Reno, I started blogging. I created a blog at christyfifelski.com. So you can imagine how many people found that. Um, <laughs> Along the way, I decided to change it to GovGirl.com. I figured it was catchy and memorable, and I started to use video. I figured that the video medium was underutilized in government. So I published a weekly video talking about government innovation, and I try really hard to make government interesting, particularly government and the intersection of government and technology. Which is why I love what you guys are doing, because it's at an interesting time where GIS meets mobility and the ability for devices to have GPS and people to carry coordinates around with them wherever they go, and the intersection of that and social media and things like crowdsourcing. So it's this really interesting time, and the projects that you're working on are cool in itself, so I don't have to try really hard to try to make it interesting. But I have this little formula, and I want to show you a GovGirl video so you know what it is I do. Here's just a clip of a GovGirl video, and my formula is I share something that's dry, kind of boring, and we talk about it in a fun way. I interject something in there that's a little bit silly, then we go back to the how-to or the tutorial or whatever we're talking about in, in government and technology, and then we go back to a clip of something fun, and that formula works. My videos are always really short, uh, typically under two minutes, and they keep people watching. Let me just show you a little clip of a GovGirl video. 
We've all been there. You have something important to discuss with the community, so you post the official notice. Well, they'll come for sure. But sometimes you just can't get people to participate. I'm going to go ahead and call this public meeting to order. If face-to-face -face town hall style meetings are your thing, then check out a new report just released by the Penfels Institute for Government. It's a step-by-step -step guide for engaging the public in person. Now let's add technology into the mix and conduct a Twitter town hall. Oh, I don't tweeter. A Twitter town hall lets you tap into the millions of people who use Twitter. Another way to have a real-time conversation with the public. If you want to hold a Twitter town hall, the first thing you have to do is establish a hashtag and promote the heck out of it. How it works is super simple. Anyone who Okay, wants I won't make you watch a whole Gov Girl video, but you get the idea. And I only know how to do one accent, so that sort of Midwestern uh, soccer mom is pretty much what I do. but um, So let me just share with you what I'm going to talk to you um, about today. And you can tell I'm from government because I have an agenda that we're going to share. Let's talk a little bit about making GIS cool. And some of the projects that you're working on and some of the ideas that you're learning about at conferences like these is making that happen. Let's talk a little bit about what's hot in social GIS as well as some social media secrets that you can use if you're considering getting your GIS uh, department on social media. First of all, let me start off talking to you about this. Um, you can't see it on the screen very well, but this is the city of Reno skyline, and behind that is a huge fire. This was back a couple of years ago in the city of Reno. It's called the Collin Fire and we had to evacuate 10,000 residents. At the time, I worked for the city of Reno, and I was called up to the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center, and I had to communicate with the public using any tools that I had. One of the tools that I had was social media, and we had made a very concerted effort when I was launch launching the city of Reno social media program a couple of years before that to have a really conversational style with residents to really talk with them instead of um, just talking at them about things that council was doing. So, and we also had a little sense of humor on social media and that worked well with the audience. I mean, come on, this is city of Reno, home of Reno 911. Humor worked for them. Anyway, so we got a pretty large audience on social media. So when the call-in fire happened, we had some important messages to share. We had to evacuate those 10,000 residents. We had to let them know where to go for the evacuation center. And when be that became endangered by the fire, we had to let them know where else to go. A lot of messages to share with them. Something else we shared with them that was really important, we got so many requests for it, was a map of the fire. This was the official fire map that was produced by the county's GIS team. And we had a website, um, a special area on reno.gov where we were funneling all of the information. And so we were posting these maps for citizens. Um, However, these maps, you know, they, the, the GIS team, they were, they were trying, they were publishing these maps, but this was just a static PDF map. And this was a couple of years ago, and people wanted more. They wanted to know what houses are in danger by the fire, what houses are consumed by the fire already. So what they turned to was this map. This map was just created by a dude in the community who was listening to the scanner and so he got information about where the fire was and where it was moving and so he just created his own map using that data. Um, this got over half a million views. Everyone was going to this interactive just Google map that someone in the community made because it was more interactive, because it was the type of style that they were used to seeing and they were used to playing around with with Google Maps. People started saying things like, well, why isn't the city or the county doing something like this? Why are they just publishing this PDF map that you have to zoom in and click zoom and click zoom and then you can start to see the street names, but you, know, you can't see the little pinpoints where the houses are, so how helpful is that? 
Well, I think that this really characterizes sort of the space that we're in right now where things are, are changing a bit. They're not so static. We do have the capability with GIS to have these more interactive type maps and um, and that's what people want, and I think that that's what we found. It, it was a lot more social. That's not to say that this map was the, the most perfect solution ever, because the person who made this opened it up for other people to sort of crowdsource and add their own pinpoints. Um, unfortunately, people aren't always that accurate. And they were noticing that some of the, the houses that had pinpoints on them that were endangered by the fire, they weren't actually endangered by the fire. And so people were nervous because they would see, you know, that their parents' house was burnt up by the fire, but it really wasn't. So in the community, they realized that there was a need for the the importance of GIS and the importance of having this, this structure and this group of highly trained individuals who come to events like this and who understand how important the data is and how important it is to display that correctly and having these mechanisms in place for doing so, as well as the modern day uh, crowdsourcing capabilities and their interactive type maps that people want to see. Let's talk a little bit about how we talk about GIS. Uh, because if you look at an agency's website, any public agency that does some form of GIS, typically they have a statement like this, which is super uncool. This I actually got from a government website. It says, the purpose of the GIS program is to use GIS as the point of convergence for all geographic-based data within the city. The GIS will become the cornerstone for supporting all future land and location decision-making and site analysis. What? OK, I know that's kind of what you really do, but that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to people. Wouldn't it be much cooler if you said it like this? Our team loves maps. We take data and turn it into cool stuff like 3D visualizations that help everyone make smart decisions about what we do with our land. Aha. Now I get it. Now I'm the college kid who just graduated with my skinny jeans and I'm looking for a job and I realize, oh, they kind of do this cool visual stuff. I want to be a part of that. And then your recruitment becomes a little bit easier. If you take a moment and just take a step back and think about how you portray what you do um, and how you would talk about it in a more simple, precise way, because in public agencies we have this problem called gov speak, this government speak. And unfortunately, even though what you do is highly technical and it takes a lot of skills to be able to manipulate and visualize this data, um, the, the way we refer to it oftentimes is just overcomplicated and uninteresting, most importantly. And I think it's um, the, the social media medium lends itself to conversation that's interesting. And where this can be a, a value to you is if people like you on social media, they will have more support for what you're trying to do. That funding that you're trying to get to upgrade your equipment, to buy some of this new fancy stuff, it'll be a lot easier. Let me just show you, in case you still aren't convinced what that gov speak looks like. We see this so many times in public agencies. How about this? Parties shall be informed that the referenced closing date of this action is deemed to be the last day of the week. When you should have just said the deadline's Friday. <laughs> or how about this? This one's more IT focused. This project is projected to enhance internal portal functionality and modernize connecting interfacing systems. What we mean is we're upgrading the intranet. I mean, think about how many times uh, you have those internal communications because it's, while it's important for the public to understand and care about what you do with GIS, it's also important for those other departments to get it too. So many times we don't communicate very well what we're, what we're doing and the, the purpose of our, um, the purpose of what our whole department is doing to the other agencies and within uh, the communities that you work for, within that either the county or the city or the educational environment, what GIS does. 
Um, or how about this one, just any old acronym. Nobody knows what any old acronym means. And so a lot of times we use this GovSpeak and we don't even realize it. I think that we're at, like I said, this really interesting time where we're sort of reinventing GIS. And I think that you see this in private industry, you see this in other government agencies where, um, like I said, that intersection of uh, mobile and social coming together and just making your, um, your data exciting. Uh, so often when old school and new school interact, we kind of feel like this. I mean, you might remember this commercial. Hello, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC. Oh, hey, iPod, nice. Yeah, it's just a little something to hold my slow jams. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah, and it works so seamlessly with iTunes. You should check out iMovie, iPhoto, iWeb, because they all work like iTunes, you know? Oh. iLife. Comes on every Mac. iLife. Well, I, I have some very cool apps that are bundled with, with me. Well, like, what do, you, what do you got? Calculator. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Clock. Clock. Sounds like, sounds yeah. like hours of fun. Yeah. Or at least minutes. <laughs> But the moral of the story is it's never too late to reinvent yourself, and it's happening here with GIS. Let me show you this more modern clip. what it means but I know I want it because of that video they put every cool thing you could imagine into the one video and the way we see this uh, reinvention happen in public agencies is things like you know the the branding the city of sparks old logo then their new logo things like libraries are reinventing themselves to be coffee shops slash libraries or movie theaters slash libraries and um, when we're talking about reinventing yourselves in terms of GIS, I asked the publishers of Government Technology Magazine and Emergency Management Magazine what some of their favorite trends that, um, that they see using, using maps and using data and what's really hot right now. Um, and I think that the, the, the big key that has happened lately, of course, that you know, is that most of the major social platforms can handle that um, tagging content in the location it was posted. And that's where the exciting things happen with GIS and social media. Um, this was a recent cover of Government Technology Magazine, and it was talking about the Red Cross and how the Red Cross recently uh, established this digital operations center in their headquarters and they're, what they're doing is they're displaying a console that has a running stream of these social mentions for these keywords that they've selected uh, that are of interest to them and they can see mentions of a disaster, of anybody talking about an earthquake or a bus crash or something like that. So they're using those social posts that people are posting on Facebook or on Twitter that they've geotagged the location that they're at and so they're seeing these kind of hot spots appear. The Navy is also uh, just recently announced that they're funding a software prototype to crowdsource this type of social media tagging for location to uh, really take a look at the situational awareness idea. It's currently in the development phase and they've contracted out to do this, but the idea is that they can use people to act as these remote type of sensors during a crisis because everyone has their mobile device on them. And so information like locations, street names, and buildings, once they're tagged in, that, in those social posts, it will allow them to collect this data and then mine it so that emergency responders can be more effective. Another favorite uh, happening that they shared with me was um, FEMA. FEMA released an updated version of their mobile app 
they had all these features before, but now you're, it's capable of uploading uh, GIS or I'm sorry, GPS tagged photos, uh, so that they can connect those with a disaster area, and then they can display it publicly on this map. And you know that's all talking about collecting that socially uh, location tagged information from citizens and pointing it out the other way, uh, something the city of Palo Alto is doing here is sharing that GIS data back to the community and they're using Google Fusion Tables, which is a free resource. I know that the state of California has been using those Google Fusion Tables for a couple of years now to um, push data out to their mobile devices and so now Palo Alto is doing that to share it with citizens. I want to share with you some social media secrets, I call them, for GIS professionals. So this is talking about your public face on social media as a GIS agency. And one of the things I'd encourage you to do is to not think like government. Don't think like a public agency. Um, there's, there's a way to do it and there's a way to do it right. Remember I talked about the, the government speak and how people just sort of turn a deaf ear to that. Well, let me show you an example here of what the Social Security Administration did. So this was, I'm not gonna show you the video, but this is a screenshot from a video where the Social Security Administration, they were trying to share some kind of boring information with the public. They wanted to encourage the public, um, you know, if you're 65 or older, go online, you can file for retirement benefits online. Instead of doing it normal paper way, bringing it to the office, you can do it online. So what they did was they did this um, kind of a spoof video where they had Patty Duke and George Takei doing this sort of Star Trek uh, spoof type video where they, I think it was like this, it's so easy even Kirk could do it. Okay, but you know, kind of the humor and people like them a lot. Um, you know, when you think of Social Security, you don't think of Patty Duke or George Takei, but you know, they used humor and this video was posted a couple of years ago and it got 17,000 views as of now. So 17,000 views is respectable for a government agency. But then they found something that works. And what works is not only having a sense of humor when, when it works, but connecting with something that's currently trending. Connecting with something that's currently hot. And you know it's hot because it has, uh, it's being talked about a lot, or if it's a YouTube video, it has a large number of views. So if you figure out a way to connect your, your programs or your project or your agency with something that is currently hot, you'll go a longer way on social media. So what they did was they found out what was hot and that is Grumpy Cat. <laughs> yeah, so Grumpy Cat is this cat that has a really mad looking face. Like it's this real cat and just its features make it look mad all the time. So they started calling it Grumpy Cat and they posted a couple of YouTube videos and of course it's an internet sensation with the, the cat with a grumpy face. And so it's an internet meme now to post things like this, this poster that has a, a something on it that's totally depressing and to post videos of other cats that just look grumpy and things like that because grumpy cat is hot. So the Social Security Administration realized, aha, this is a trend. So how can we do that, uh, use that in some way? So instead of having Patty Duke, George Takei in a video talking about going online to apply for retirement benefits, they had a cat in a video telling people to go online. <laughs> And it was kind of, you know, depressing as you listen to it. It's like, yeah, go on that computer thing and get online. And what? Do you know how many views this got in a month? Not 17,000, 170,000. 170,000 views in a month. And I guarantee it was a volunteer cat. So <laughs> I guarantee it costs a lot less than the other method. 
So if you're considering getting your agency, your department, GIS on social media, then think about a, a way to connect your projects or programs with something that's currently trending. Um, the CDC did that with their zombie pre preparedness campaign, which I created a GovGirl video on, and it was my most watched GovGirl video of all time because zombies are hot right now. I never thought I would say that to a group of people, but they are. Zombies are hot right now. Um, taking a look at some of the platforms that we know and some that we might not know, Vine. Vine is a app for your phone. And with Vine, you can do these short six second videos. So you can put it all together. You can record for six seconds by pressing down the button, or you can record up to six seconds at various moments by pressing the button and then lifting up up to six seconds. So it winds up looking like this sort of poor man's stop motion animation video. Governments and public agencies are still trying to figure out what to do with the Vine app. They're doing things like showing musical events and things like that. I would like to see um, a, and if this exists somewhere, let me know because I think it would be really cool, but a map that pulls in Vine location information for um, agencies, so something like a, a public officials or a uh, government staff members, as they post vines, you can see, look on a map and see where the different vines are and see their, the locations that those vines were shot. Okay, we all know Facebook. Um, I think that, that one trend with public agencies is that they're now starting to use social media and the Facebook platform a lot like private industry does. In private industry, they use it in a whole different way. It's not just for communicating with the public, obviously. It's to capture leads. And they use emails in a very sophisticated way. And unfortunately, I think that GIS often gets left out of those email lists, you know, as you have those email lists on your website, whatever the main agency's website is, and they have like subscribe for these type of updates, subscribe for this. I think GIS gets left out a lot as far as like just subscribe when we have new maps coming out or new data coming out, things like that. And um, one of the things that you can do within Facebook, which is a little bit more sophisticated, is take those email lists and create an audience in Facebook where you can advertise just specifically to those people. So specific people who have connected with your department or your agency in some way, you can target them for advertisements. And in your advertisements, you can tell them anything, you know, like your page, you can lead them to a website, anything like that. A lot of times when we see GIS pages on Facebook, people really don't know what to do with them. GIS is so visual, why have just a text only Facebook page. I'm sorry to pick on this one in particular. It looks like um, like so many agencies, they started off, let's create a Facebook page because everybody's on Facebook. It sounds like a good idea. Oh, what do we post? Well, we had that intern post like five posts and then they left and now we don't know what to do with it. <laughs> so let's just tell people, hey, here's a new map. Here's another new map. How about this one? Aerials have been flown. I'm sure that's very important in the GIS world, but no one in the public knows what an aerial is. It's an under the sea type of thing. So what I'm saying here is to talk as though you're talking with someone from the public, from the, the, just an average citizen that has no idea what this terminology is. Um, and, and GIS, as I said, is so visual. So show those maps, link back to it. And if you're getting on Twitter, some of the hashtags, which are just those searchable uh, keywords that people look for stuff on Twitter, um, some of the popular hashtags for GIS is just GIS, maps, mapping, and I've also seen geospatial. You know, the newest resource with Twitter is the sponsored tweets and the sponsored accounts. And if you're creating one of these accounts for your agency, I'd definitely uh, recommend that, I know it's so hard to put budget aside for anything, but to put budget aside for advertising and do some Twitter advertising. Advertise your GIS Twitter handles. A lot of times, again, we see GIS Twitter accounts that sort of, they're not going very far because they 
don't really know what types of content to post where they're not posting very frequently. They're just not talking in a way where people would care about the fact that, you know, there's a new map in there somewhere. Um, like this one says, new bedrock layer added to Scott GIS 2.0. What does that mean to anyone? It doesn't mean a whole lot. So figure out how to phrase these things so it will appear, appeal to the general public. A lot of GIS agencies aren't doing a whole lot with the look and the branding of these accounts. And if you do have a public information officer or a communications manager, graphic design department, something, see if you can get their help in creating these profiles because it's going to go a long way to getting people realizing that, you know, this is an official account and it might be something I'd want to follow. So many of these accounts, I noticed that they, they're posting like once a month on these accounts and that's not the way to get a following. Why even worry about a following on social media? Well, I'll tell you, when I had to share those maps for the city of Reno, it really helped to have such a large following on social media. It helped to already have that there because we were feeding them information that was of interest to them. So when I really needed it, when I had to communicate some critical information to them, I had that audience already there. At one point at the city of Reno, we had more uh, followers on Facebook and people who had liked our page than the city of Las Vegas, which was kind of exciting, you know, considering the population difference. So one of the things you can do is to follow those accounts, those agencies that are successful. Um, I recommend following the City of Seattle Police Department on Twitter because they do some fun things. They have this post here, brief disturbance earlier at 5th and Jackson between superheroes and clowns. Everything's under control. You know, I don't know what the reason for that post was, but I know that that post fascinated me and made me laugh a little bit, and so I decided to follow them. And because of that, I get their updates in times where it's important and where they're not using humor, things like um, you know, street closures or there's a criminal that they need to locate. Um, it's, just to wrap up the social platforms, I really think you should take a look again at LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a publicly traded company now, by the way, and it has been for the last two years. They're doing really, really well. Their stock keeps going up and up. Um, they have this new content strategy for LinkedIn, so it's not just a platform to connect professionals together um, and connect professionals to job openings that they're looking for. Their content strategy is to also get these influencers, they call them, to write content for the main page. So if you check LinkedIn often, you might find that you're checking it more than you were because there's a lot of articles on there and some interesting content on there. I think it's a really good home for some of the things that you're doing in here. GIS uh, could be turned into a LinkedIn group. And I believe that there's some activity um, with, this, uh, with this organization and um, some of the uh, member agencies on LinkedIn in terms of groups. Um, I think that you could create a page for your uh, GIS division and get people interested in your, what you do in that way. And you can post updates for free. It's all free. One of the things I like about LinkedIn groups is you can connect other people who are interested in that topic. And the default settings are to get emails to them. So it's a great way to get in their inbox every day um, just by posting on LinkedIn. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up here, and I just want to let you know to get GovGirl email. Go to GovGirl.com. I have a tutorial video pretty much about every social media platform on there. We talk about government innovation. We talk about some of the cool things that uh, is going on with, with data and mapping. And I always like to have that little sense of humor in there, and so you can be prepared to just watch short videos that are lighthearted and talk a little bit about the light, lighter side of government. But you can also put your email address in there and sign up for my weekly email. Or you can click on the mail button if you want to talk to me directly. It'll go right to me and you can tell me you know, some of your stories. I love hearing stories about what other agencies are doing. And it gives me material for other videos. 
I know that you have a wonderful conference here planned uh, before you. You have so many great sessions that really dive into the weeds and into how to do this. It sounds like I missed a lot of stuff last night, so I'm going to check it out on YouTube. I'm really excited to hear about that. But thank you very much for letting me speak with you, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. <laughs>